Hello, everybody. Revelation 4 and 1 says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet, talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I'll show thee things which must be hereafter. Isaiah said, Lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people. And so this voice that sounded like a trumpet, saying a door was opened in heaven, represents revelation, show my people. And then John said, immediately I was in the spirit and behold, the first thing you see when you get in the spirit of God, if it's the spirit of God, is the kingship of Jesus Christ. He said a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. We're going to continue right now with our study from last week. It's part three of where do we go from here? And what it's about is the form of prophecy that I'm proposing the Bible teaches, what does it leave us expecting in our future? What are we to do in this world because of it? And if you've missed any of this, the uh, first two lessons from last week and then a week before that really gets into it. We covered a lot of material. I didn't even think this would go to the third week, but here we are in the third week. And, And it's good to do that, to really slow down. So let's give God praise and give Jesus Christ all glory and thanks and ask him to just enlighten our eyes, Lord, enlighten our understanding, enlighten our eyes so that we might understand your truth and be like John in the spirit so you can open up a door in heaven, as it were, and we can receive understanding and insight. So let's go right into this right now. And we left off last time talking a bit about this and This is kind of like a lesson in itself. This is going to bless you because what we're going to do is take things from Revelation, bring it together and tie it with the rest of the, (laughs) excuse me, the rest of the Bible. And it's all going to represent what Jesus wants to do in our lives. Now, the Bible tells us, and we left off talking about this last week, that in John chapter 12, Jesus had just ridden into Jerusalem on a colt, the foal of an ass, They call it the triumphal entry. It was done on what is called Palm Sunday, a week to the day before he resurrected. Between this day, he rode into Jerusalem as Jerusalem's king. And a week later, they would crucify him. But in John chapter 12, verse 20 to 21, there were certain Greeks. And then it goes on and says, they desired him saying, sir, we would see Jesus. So they talked to one of the disciples. We want to see Jesus. And then Jesus made this statement and talk about first impressions. Talk about coming up with something that you're going to introduce yourself to another person with and leave a lasting impression on them. And by this, we're going to realize Jesus didn't just mince words. He he went right to the point of what he wanted them to know about him. And of course, back then, they weren't even spirit filled yet. The church hadn't even been born again on the day of Pentecost. Uh, weeks later, they wouldn't have completely understood this and it probably boggled their mind. But just listen to what he said. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. In reality, Jesus was talking about himself. They wanted to see Jesus. They wanted to know about him. And this is what he chose to talk to them about. Remember Adam in the Garden of Eden? He was all alone. Well, Jesus compared himself to a kernel of wheat that would be all alone also, unless it would fall into the ground and die. And then, strangely, through that death, it bringeth forth much fruit. Now, you can understand that with a kernel of wheat and a seed, because you know if you plant a seed, it's going to come up again and bear many more. But to think of him like that, they didn't know about the resurrection. He had talked to them about it, and he even says they, they didn't know what he was talking about. And you know, if you and I were there too, we probably wouldn't have understood it either. But now that we look back on it and realize he resurrected, and, and he's calling himself somebody that had to die in order to never be alone anymore and come forth and bear much fruit, just like a seed, a corn, a corn seed goes into the ground. How many more corns, kernels of corn are on those cobs after that grows into a stalk? It's multiplied many, many times. And Jesus said he's like that. You know, I even saw this once in 
John chapter 6, where Jesus takes bread and breaks it and multiplies it and, and gives it to his disciples to feed 5,000 people. Two loaves and three fishes, just small boy's lunch. But he breaks it and then it multiplies. And Jesus is the bread of life. And didn't he say in the Last Supper, this is my body which is broken for you, and he gave them bread. Well, that breaking represents his death. And because he would die and be broken, it would multiply just like he multiplied the broken bread and the fishes in John chapter 6. Isn't that wonderful? Now, we're all like those little seeds that came up in his branches. He even said, I'm the vine and you're the branches. And Adam, when he was all alone, God had to put him into a deep sleep, which represents death. Maybe Adam even died. Maybe that's what that meant. But the point is, Adam was no longer alone after he went into that deep sleep because out of Adam's body, God took material and made Adam's bride. And the church is called the bride of Jesus. Just like Adam's side had a rib taken out, well, Jesus' side was pierced when he was on the cross and the blood and the water came out. And oh, could we ever talk to you about the blood and the water representing the death and the, the spirit of God living water. But Jesus said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. And all of that is symbolic of the church being born. And my wife actually, after last week's Bible study, we had an interesting talk. And, and it was Sunday sermon, I think. And she mentioned how that Eve came forth from Adam. And when a woman is born, she has all the eggs already in her body that she'll ever have the rest of her life. Like, I, no one knows how many there are, but she already has them when she's born. And so isn't that interesting that out of Adam came forth this uh, basis of, of him being reproduced? And that's exactly like Jesus's church. It's because of the cross. We came forth from him, spiritually speaking, if you get what I'm saying, from his death on the cross. And that's what he meant. And so think of this. He's the seed. They wanted to see Jesus, and he described himself as a kernel or a corn of wheat dying and then going into that ground and bringing forth much. That's what the resurrection was all about. And Jesus is actually using the picture that he's like the resurrection tree. The tree of life. Remember the cross was called a tree. In the book of Acts, when they were preaching the gospel, Peter pointed his finger in the people's faces. Paul would preach at them and said, you hanged him on a tree and God resurrected him from the dead. So they called the cross a tree. No coincidence. I know it was made out of wood, but there's a picture there because he died on that cross, took our death. We could have his eternal life. He took our death. He gave us his eternal life. Isn't that what Adam would have if he ate the fruit of the tree of life? eternal life? Praise God. And so the Bible talks about the eyes of our understanding being enlightened. Now, when they said we would see Jesus, seeing represents understanding. Ephesians chapter 1 talks about the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. And how many can say you saw the light? That means you understood the truth. Now, we're connected to his resurrection. We see that we are like his branches. And that's a spiritual message when they said they wanted to see Jesus. And then he responded saying a seed goes into the ground and it's no longer alone because it's going to come up and have much fruit. Well, that's a picture of us understanding that we are going to be the branches of this resurrection tree. Jesus even said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Without me, you can bear no fruit. So there it is in Ephesians 1 and 19. What is the exceeding greatness of his power? This is what he said, the eyes of your understanding. If you go back to verse 18 and go back to verse 17. He wants you to see what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward. Praise God. Who believe? According, now he's going to tell you how great this power is. It's according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. That's the kind of power that God wants you to be able to see that he's giving to you 
if you're a member of his church, you belong to him. And when I say church, I don't mean denomination. I mean, you are living for Jesus. You're one of his followers. You're the church, the people. The church was never a building in the Bible. That became tradition centuries later. But God wants you to see that that resurrection power that he raised Jesus up with is for you right now. And not only that, and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. The power that put Jesus on the throne in heaven, took him out of the grave and put him on the throne. The Bible says God wants to show you that's the power he has to help you with. Now, can you imagine the devil's greatest power was death and God's power that conquered death by resurrecting somebody from the dead, that's conquering death. You've got death conquering power in you. That was the devil's power. You've got more power now. You've got power that conquered the devil. And can you imagine what it would be like in your confidence if when you went through hardships and the devil was working on you, making you go through hard things, then you remembered, wait a minute, I've got death destroying power on me right now. I've got resurrection power that broke the devil's back, crushed his head, the Bible says, and put Jesus on the throne. That's the power I've got. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that's named. That's the kind of power you and I have toward you, toward us. And God wants us to see and understand that. Amen. So that power, according to the power that he wrought in Christ. Powerful. Now, speaking of trees and plant language... Romans 11 and 16 says, If the root be holy, so are the branches. Remember when Jesus said in John 15, I'm the vine, you're the branches. That meant that the sap that comes out of the vine goes into the branch if it's connected to the vine. Now that's why Jesus said, Abide in me and I in you. Stay connected to me. Without me, you can't bear any fruit. Try breaking off a branch from a vine and see how much fruit it's going to grow. He said, men don't do anything with branches like that other than burn them in the fire. But he said, if you stay connected to me, if you have your trust in me, if you have your faith in me, that's what it all represents, then you're going to bear fruit. So not only that, we're also going to have the holiness of the root. If the root's holy, so are the branches. Your holiness, folks, doesn't come from the holy things that you do. Your holiness comes from Jesus and his goodness. And then Ephesians 2 verse 5 and 6 says, When we were dead in sins, God quickened us or resurrected us together with Christ. Spiritually, when you get saved, it's like you're resurrected with Jesus. Now remember the power that raised up Jesus from the dead is for you. Chapter 1, we're in chapter 2 now. Now he's telling you, you were resurrected with him. No wonder, he said, the power that resurrected Jesus is with you now. You might as well say, you're resurrected with him then. By grace are you saved. And then what was the second thing that that power was according to? The power for us? It's according to the power he resurrected Jesus with. And number two, and put him on the throne. That's why verse six says, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places. We were dead and we were made alive, spiritually speaking. And we were put on the throne and seated with Jesus. That's why he said, the power for you is the same power that raised Jesus and enthroned him. Hallelujah. We are seated with him. So John actually saw a vision of Jesus in Revelation 1 in branches. There's branches all around him. See, in Revelation 1 and 20, the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Now, the reason he's told this is because if you read before verse 20, you read that I saw Jesus standing in the midst of seven golden candlesticks. And then he tells you the seven candlesticks are the seven churches. Candlesticks, remember the three branches coming out of each side of that stem, that Jewish menorah? the candlestick, three branches. It was shaped like a tree and it was particularly shaped like an almond tree with almond branches. When they made that candlestick with the three branches coming out and the one in the middle, they had flowers, buds, and uh, almonds molded into it. 
like almond branches. Didn't Jesus say, we are the branches and he's the vine? And now he's calling these seven branch candlesticks. These, John, represent the seven churches because the church is a branch of Jesus. He's the vine, we're the branches. He's the vine, we're the branches. John saw all that in a vision. It had bowls what the King James Version calls knops and flowers. The bowls are the fruit, the almonds. The knops are the buds, and there's the flowers. And there it tells you in Exodus chapter 25, verse 31, what that candlestick looked like that John saw Jesus standing in. Thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold. Okay, It's of beaten work that the candlestick shall be made. It talks about a shaft and his branches. And then the bowls or the nuts, the almonds, the knops or the buds, and the flowers shall be of the same. It's all one piece of gold. Bowls, knops, and flowers represent all three stages of growth on a branch. You see, when a branch brings forth almonds, that all started with a bud coming forth first. And then after the bud or the knop, this is old English knop for bud, the flower came. And then, of course, the flower gets pollinated and all of that. And then the bowls or the almonds, the fruit. And so you're seeing at the same time all three stages of growth in the candlestick. Now, nature can't do that. You can't go out and find a branch that has a bud and right above the bud, it's got the flower. And then above the flower, it's got the fruit. Because that's just three separate stages. The bud is gone by the time the flower comes. And then there's the fruit after that. But God is showing us something that's not natural. He's showing us something supernatural. Knops are the buds, then the flowers, and the bowls are the fruit. So there's a shaft with branches, the bowls, knops, and flowers, the nuts, the uh, buds, and the flowers. So this imagery in Revelation, when John sees Jesus standing in the midst of the seven candlesticks, that is all from the tabernacle and the temple, like I read in Exodus. They were making that candlestick for the tabernacle. Remember where the Ark of the Covenant was placed? And that's what it looked like. And notice, you see all these elements. Um, I wish I could get up here. You see, the bottom would be the bud. And then there's the flower and then the fruit, the knop above that. And all these sets of bud, flower, and fruit, blood, bud, flower, and, and fruit is all on those branches. It's shaped like an almond tree. So Jesus is like the stem. He's like the shaft. John saw him standing in the middle of this candlestick, the seven golden candlesticks. It's not like seven distinct lamps so, uh, pulls like one single candle on seven stands. It's seven branches, including the shaft. So the shaft represents Jesus. He's the vine. And the churches are represented by the branches. The seven candlesticks, he told John, they represent the seven churches. So in this branch of a candlestick shows buds, flowers, and fruit at the same time, which nature can't do. You know what that represents? It's life but it's more abundant life. It's more than normal life. It's not mortal life. It's resurrection life. A branch never has buds, flowers, and fruit on it at the same time. Nature can't do that. But in Numbers chapter 17, verse 8, there's another picture of an almond branch that had those three things at the same time. And it wasn't just a molded golden candlestick. This was the real thing. Look at this. It came to pass that on the morrow... Moses went into the tabernacle of the witness. And you see what had happened at this point in this story is that Israel and some of the people were in the Exodus when Moses had took them into the wilderness going on the way to Canaan. They said, we, we, we can be leaders too, Moses, not just you and your brother, not just the Levite priest family. We can all be priests. And God says, okay, Moses, you tell every one of them to take a rod from their tribe their leader's tribe, rod, staff. And since there was 12 tribes, they took 12 rods. And write their name, carve their name on each staff, and lay it up before the Ark of the Covenant. 
and I'm going to leave it overnight. And God's going to show you a miracle and give you a sign of who the priests are. And so he laid them there. And then like we read, on the morrow, Moses went into the tabernacle of witness and behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi was budded and brought forth buds and bloom blossoms and yielded almonds. That is flat out supernatural. You can't see that. Now, God did this on purpose because they could say, yeah, Moses, while we were sleeping, you just found an almond tree somewhere and you broke it off and, and you laid it in there and replaced that, that dead staff of Aaron and then carved Aaron's name in there. And then you said, hey, look, Moses brought out all the rods from before the Lord unto the children of Israel. And they looked and took every man his rod. But that this could not be counterfeited. Nature, Moses would never been able to find a branch that had buds, flowers, and fruit on it at the same time. But that's exactly, so isn't it interesting that the seven golden candlesticks had the same picture of almond buds, almond flowers, and almond fruit that this branch of Aaron had, budded, brought forth blossoms, and yielded almonds? It's specifically almond branches that the candles tip. When God showed me this, I was just reading the Bible one day and ran across this and the Holy Spirit of God opened my eyes and started showing me, look at what the candlestick looked like. And I couldn't believe it. It's the same thing. I had never heard anyone preach that. I never heard anyone make that comparison. You see, you know what happened to me that day? A door was opened in heaven and God said, come on up. I'm going to show you some things. And then I, be, I was in the spirit. Praise God. But this represents the church and it represents resurrection because think of it, a dead staff, it's, it's a, a staff of wood is a dead branch. And that dead branch is laid in before the Ark of the Covenant and the glory supernatural power from the Ark of the Covenant, it resurrects that branch because a dead stick to have buds, flowers and fruit literally resurrected. So here you've got a story in the Old Testament, 1,500 years before Jesus was ever born, that represents Jesus being resurrected from the dead because the prophecies called Jesus a branch out of the root of Jesse. It called him a branch. And then you read this Exodus story and this branch is laid before the ark and the power of the ark resurrects it and gives it life, but it doesn't give it natural life. It gives it supernatural life, which is what the buds, fruit, and almonds, um, and flowers simultaneously demand it be. That's not natural life. That's resurrection life. See the symbolism in the Bible? Oh, this got a hold of my heart for years. It blessed me so much. Life more abundantly, folks resurrection. And what did Paul just say back in Ephesians that he wants your eyes of understanding open for you to see? That the power for you is the power that raised up Jesus from the dead. In other words, we've got, oh, the Lord's just showing me this right now. Jesus is on that throne. Just like the Ark of the Covenant, and I've got a model of the Ark of the Covenant here. The Ark of the Covenant had a mercy seat that lid was called the mercy seat. It represents the throne of God. So when those rods were laid down before the Ark of the Covenant, it's like they were laid down before the throne of God. And what's the first thing John saw when heaven was opened and the door was opened? He saw a throne. The Ark of the Covenant represented the throne. And just like in front of that Ark, those, that rod came to life, well, Jesus is on the throne in heaven right now. And when you bow your knee before him on the throne, just like the rods were being laid, like they were bowing before the throne, the ark represented the throne, he gives you resurrection life. The power that raised him from the dead comes from him and comes upon you. And the power that put him on the throne that you're bowing before comes from him and comes on you so that you can say, like Ephesians 2 said, which we read a few minutes earlier, you are are quickened and raised from the dead with Christ. And two, you're also seated together with him on the throne because the power that raised and enthroned him is on you. So you can say, I've been raised and I've been seated with Jesus too.
Oh, wow, man. Sometimes this stuff comes to me so fast while I'm teaching. I hope I don't go too fast trying to explain it. But it's like I got to keep up with God when he puts these thoughts in my mind. So the priesthood is the people that have resurrection life in them. The Levites were chosen as priests by the almond rod. The almond rod proved. Remember, they all wanted to be priests. And Moses said, okay, we're going to find out which among you will be the priests. Well, Jesus in the New Testament, that was the old. Aaron was a high priest in the Old Testament. The first high priest. Jesus is the New Testament high priest. And Revelation shows almond branches, which were used to represent the temple and tabernacle candlestick, and which symbolized the priesthood people by the almond rod coming to life. Revelation uses those same pictures of almond branches showing the same resurrection life of Jesus. And God said, Jesus had people come to him and said, we want to see Jesus. And remember, see means understand. You're supposed to understand that you can see that you're in him. He's the shaft. You're the branches. You're connected to him. And if you can realize that the sap that's in the shaft is flowing into you, the branches, all the churches in the world that obey the Bible. Not every church obeys the Bible. There's some false doctrine out there. But the true churches, then you have that resurrection life in you. If Jesus' resurrection life is for us, the power that raised him from the dead is for us, then now you know that the sap inside the vine that flows into you, the branch, is that resurrection life. The sap is the life of the vine. And if Jesus has resurrection life, and he's represented by a vine with a branch, which represents you, the sap or the life from the branch uh, vine goes into you, the branch. And that's resurrection life coming into you. Praise God. So you know what? The Bible actually calls all Christians priests. Now, some denominations just call their leader a priest. But the Bible, if you want to go to the Bible, it says all of us are priests because we're all plugged into Jesus. Now, Revelation begins with Jesus as the light. He's in candlesticks, right? And then Paul said, your eyes need to be enlightened. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. It's using the same word. And listen to this. Revelation literally means unveiling. A veil stops you from seeing. When the veil is unveiled, you see. So all of this is screaming out to us when we read the beginning of the book of Revelation in chapter 1. He's among seven candlesticks, and the candlesticks represent the churches, and the churches are lights, lights to lighten up a dark place. Didn't Jesus say, you're the light of the world? You lighten up a dark world? And then then the book is called Revelation or Unveiling or Allowing You to See. It's the, called the book of Allowing You to See. That's basically what it is. Remove the veil. You see, the veil was what hid the Ark of the Covenant from people's view. So if you remove the veil, God's glory was on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. God literally shone in glorious light from that Ark. And, and glory is light. And so when you remove the veil, you see the light. That's why the Bible says symbolically, there's a veil on our hearts. We can't see the light. But if we'll turn to Jesus, that light, see the light shining on my face? That light shines and unveils our hearts and we see the light. But you've got to turn your heart to Jesus. In other words, you've got to believe in him with all your heart. And then he shines the light and you see glory. You get revelation when that happens. Glory. The glory we see changes us into the same image. Remember Moses when he saw the glory of God? His face was shining and it was so bright they had to put a veil on it. Well, in the New Testament, the Bible uses that as a symbol. Jesus didn't put a veil on his face like Moses did. And on the Mount of Transfiguration, when his face shone like the sun, you don't read of them putting a veil on his face. In fact, Moses was there. John, James, Peter and James and John saw 
Moses and Elijah appear with Jesus. Look in Matthew chapter 17 and you'll read it yourself. And Jesus' face was shining like the sun. And the last time that happened was with the guy that appears with Jesus, Moses. But he had to put a veil on his face. But here Jesus isn't putting a veil on his face. So we see that. We're changed into the same image. That means we have his life. We have his power. So if we look at Jesus and he's on the throne and he's resurrected from the dead, we are changed into that same image so we can say, we rise from the dead when we get saved from sin and we're seated with Jesus, just like Ephesians 2 verse 5 and 6 says. And that's like the glory coming from the Ark of the Covenant shone onto that dead stick and brought it to life. Oh, praise God. My, my, my. Changed into his image. Look at this in 2 Corinthians 3 and 15. This is what I was talking about. But even unto this day... When Moses is read, now that simply means if all you're reading is the Old Testament, that's the law of Moses. You're not reading the New. And Jews in that day that didn't believe in Jesus, just like Jews today that don't believe in Jesus, they only read the Old Testament. They don't believe the New at all. But he says even to this day, when Moses is read, when you're just reading the Old Testament, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when that heart shall turn to Jesus the Lord. The veil shall be taken away. You get a revelation. An unveiling means a revelation. Now the Lord is that spirit. He's the spirit that takes that veil away from your heart. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. You want to know what kind of liberty he's talking about? Your heart is liberated from a veil. Your heart is unveiled. It's made free so that it can see the light. Because the veil stopped it from seeing the light. But where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. And we all, with open face, see, we're looking at Jesus, and he's not like Moses that put a veil on his face. He has an open face. And beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, not veiled, we're looking right at his face, and it's shining. We are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. That's because the Spirit of the Lord, he, where that Spirit is, there's liberty. And so by changing us into His same image, we get more and more liberty. God's just showing me something else right now. I'm getting a revelation and unveiling here right now that you had liberty when you turned your heart to Jesus. That means when you believed and God ripped the veil off your heart. And suddenly it's like a supernatural experience. I understand. I get it. I get it. The lights are coming on. And the more you gaze at Jesus, how many want to become more like him? More and more like him. If you're changed doing the same image by looking at his glory in his face, that means the more you look at him, the more you're going to be changed to be like him. And it's all making you more at liberty because all of this is by the Spirit. And the Spirit brings liberty. So the more you let the Spirit of God work, the more He's going to give your heart liberty. Praise God. Give you liberty from hurt and, and pain and memories and sorrows. He'll give you liberty from that. Praise God. The veil's taken away so that you can look at the glory of the Lord. Didn't the veil block the glory of God that appeared over the Ark of the Covenant? And remember when Jesus died and the veil ripped open? The Ark wasn't in there, but if it was... People would have seen the ark because it always had been veiled before that. Well, that all represents the glory in Jesus. The veil is removed and we're seeing glory behind the veil, just like the glory of God was on the ark behind the veil. And it's like God says to your heart, let there be light. Praise God. Let there be light in your heart. And he unveils you and he shines his glory in you and it changes you. Didn't God change the world when he said, let there be light, when there was darkness over the face of the deep? And isn't it the word of God when he said, God said, let the earth bring forth. God said, let the heavens be divided. God said, let the ground bring forth grass and the herbs. God's word is what God says. And when you get the word of God and you're looking at Jesus, not just the Old Testament, the veil stays on your heart, but get into the new and the veil's removed, then God's word 
is saying, let there be in your world. Your life is your world. You were made from the dust of the earth. So when God spoke to the earth and commanded things, that represents God speaking to you who are made from the dust of the earth and God changes you. And what was the last thing God did in the book of Genesis chapter one? The last miraculous creation work? He made man in his image. And that's why we're changed into his image from glory to glory. When God says, let there be light, let there be truth in that person's heart. And then it says, after chapter 3 talks about, we look at his face as in a mirror and we're changed into that same image. The next chapter, 4 and 6, says, for God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts. You see, when you turn your heart to the Lord, the veil comes off and the glory of God shines and changes you into his image. And it's saying the same thing. And it's actually comparing it with Genesis here in the next chapter. When God commanded the light to shine out of darkness, that's from Genesis when God said, let there be light. And he's saying that represents giving you light also. But it's not just light as in a light bulb. It's light of knowledge. Knowledge. You get knowledge of the glory of God in your heart. And it's in the face of Jesus. Because remember, Jesus' face is unveiled. Moses veiled his face. But Jesus appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration. His face shone full of light. That represents, according to this verse, knowledge of God's glory coming into you. It's glory, but it's knowledge of glory. In other words, I see the light. I understand now. Praise God. It gives us light. Now, when that candlestick had branches coming out of it, and the Bible said the churches are represented by those branches, that speaks of us being united to Jesus like a branch is to a vine. It's abiding in him as the branch abides in the vine. Revelation shows us Jesus. If we can see Jesus resurrected in glory, spiritually speaking, in other words, understand that, you're going to see yourself risen with glory. Because like I said, going back again, Ephesians 1 said the power that raised up Jesus is on your life if you're a real believer in Jesus. So you're going to see yourself resurrect like Jesus was resurrected. You see him and you're changed into the same image from glory to glory. He's got resurrection life. You get resurrection life. He's seated on the throne. You are seated together with him. It's all an understanding that he's talking about. You don't physically see with these eyes Jesus on the throne. And that's what does the work. No, eyes represent your understanding. You understand that God said the power that resurrected Jesus is on us. My, when you realize that, the devil's nothing anymore. I mean, the power of Jesus when he resurrected defeated the devil. All he could do was kill. But Jesus raised from the dead, took what was killed and made it alive again and said, take that devil. And devil couldn't do anything more. And when you realize that's the power on your life, just tear him apart next time the devil confronts you and tell him the power that raised Jesus from the dead is for you. Hallelujah. You're changed into his same image, folks. He's trying to get this across. It's like, see, you look in a mirror and in a mirror, you are what you're seeing. Now, what Jesus is saying is see me, you're looking in a mirror, but this mirror changes you into my image. Talk about mirror, mirror on the wall. <laughs> You're seeing Jesus and he's changing you into your, in his image. So it's a mirror, but it's way beyond a mirror. It changes you. The reason it's called a mirror is because what you see is supposed to be you and you're looking at Jesus and God's giving you a message. Get the hint. You're supposed to see yourself in the mirror. Well, look at me and you see yourself. Look at me. My holiness is yours. I'm giving it to you. My resurrection is yours. I was alone, but I'm going to come up in resurrection with many more like me. Like me. My image. Are you getting this? <laughs> See, the branches are part of the vine. The branch shares the qualities of the vine. And we are sharing the qualities of Jesus. We realize that the power in raising Jesus is also toward us. Again, read Ephesians chapter 1. And get that. So we actually rule and we reign with Jesus now.
right now. A lot of people are thinking, well, when we all die and go to heaven or go into the millennium, we'll be ruling with Jesus. And you're missing it. You've got to see right now. You're seated with him right now. You've got power. Well, Mike, I'm not ruling Canada and I'm not ruling the White House in the USA. That you're missing it. We're ruling in spiritual terms over sin, even over sickness if you've got the faith. And, and over devils, demons, and especially you're ruling over your own lusts. Are you ruling over your own lusts? Are you getting victory over your own lusts? Because you should be. And if you're not, you've never had the revelation yet that you've got power over that. But I hope this is giving you faith to start realizing, boy, oh boy, I got to get into Ephesians chapter 1 and get what Mike's trying to tell me. I want God, and you know what you need to do? Read Ephesians 1 and pray. When you get down to about verse 17, pray, say, God, Help me understand what this says. I want to get it. I want to grasp it. And this is talking about now. Ruling with him now. Watching my time here. Bible said sin shall not have dominion over you. Now, John saw a revelation of Jesus and realized, I'm united to Jesus. That's all the spiritual message in just chapter 1. Look at Romans 6 and 5. If we've been planted, notice the terminology. Remember Jesus was planted like a seed? Well, isn't it interesting when Jesus was buried? Notice, did you know he was buried in a garden? The garden is where his tomb was. It was near the cross. So I preach this Sunday. You got the cross, which is like the tree of life. And it's, there's a garden there. And there's a burial of a seed Oh, all of this is a beautiful picture. But now we find out in Romans 6, I got a whole book on this called Sin Less. You can get it at Amazon. But if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, see, we look at him and we share his experiences. What's true of him is true of us. His death was your death to sin. He didn't need to die to sin. You did. So his death counts as yours. So you've been planted together in the likeness of his death. If that's the case, then you're going to be in the likeness of his resurrection. You're going to have his resurrection under your belt. For in that he died, verse 10, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Now take everything in verse 10. And notice it's repeated in verse 11, but it's repeated for you. In that he died, he died unto sin. Look at the beginning of verse 11. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. He died unto sin once in verse 10. So you need to reckon yourself to be dead indeed unto sin. And the second part, in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Well, look at the second part of verse 11. But alive unto God through Jesus Christ. See what that word through Jesus Christ means? It happened with him. And God is counting it as if it happened to you. He died to sin once, you're buried, you're planted into that death. I have baptized many, many people in my ministry in water. And the Bible calls it burying the people with Jesus. Just like Jesus was buried in a tomb, when you get baptized... Now, I don't want to offend anybody, but baptism in the Bible was not sprinkling water on a child. In the Bible, and that's what we're concerned about, they actually immersed an adult in to the water, a teenager or an adult or a youth, as long as they can understand the gospel. And it's like you're being buried in the tomb with Jesus. So when it says in verse 5, if you've been planted together in the likeness of his death, that's talking about baptism. You're going to be in the likeness of his resurrection because when he died, he died unto sin. So you reckon yourself to be dead unto sin. And when he lives, he lives unto God. Now you are alive unto God through Jesus Christ. Through him doing it, it becomes us. We didn't personally directly do it but through him when he did it we did it it counts as us hallelujah that's why paul said not i but christ that's resurrection it's restoration it's actually taking us back to the eden again in the garden because adam when god created him had no sin he went to the wrong tree and he got the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil and he sinned and he had to die he had to be kicked out but God's saying, okay, I'm getting you back on track now. Now the tree of life is the cross. And now you're going to eat the fruit, which was represented by the body and the blood of Jesus. And 
I'm giving you resurrection life so you can go back to the garden again. Your sins are taken away. Your sins that kicked you out of the garden are now forgiven so you can go back into the garden. That almond branch was dead and it now had life. But it wasn't normal natural life. It was life more abundantly. Our old man, folks, is destroyed. Our old life is gone. Paul was a murderer. He was actually uh, contributing to the murder of Stephen when he used to be called Saul of Tarsus. Paul was formerly called Saul of Tarsus, and he endorsed the killing of the first Christian. And so Paul was forgiven. Paul, a murderer of a Christian, was forgiven. And God takes all of us, no matter what we did, and forgets our past. How'd you like you have your whole past of history and sin erased? Well, in God's mind, your history is erased when you're born again. Born again. And now Jesus is living in us. That's, it's not I anymore. It's Christ who lives in me. That's in Galatians 2 and 20, by the way. So we're in Christ like a branch is plugged into the vine. You get it? It's all shown in the symbolism of the first chapter of Revelation. And that's just one chapter. I actually have videos, 30-some videos, of the whole book of Revelation on YouTube. And I go chapter by chapter. And this is just chapter one. Only those who die with Jesus have eyes that can see beyond the veil, though. Revelation, remember, means unveiling. In Exodus 26 and 31, look what he described the veil. See, the veil... All of this unveiling symbolism comes from the Old Testament. The veil was blue. It was purple and scarlet and fine twined linen of cunning work. With carabeams shall it be made. Now in Ezekiel chapter 1 and Ezekiel chapter 10, that was Exodus, but now I'm talking about Ezekiel, carabeams that were sewn into that veil, God showed Ezekiel what they looked like. They had eyes all over them, eyes on their wings, eyes on their arms. So you know it's symbolic. Jesus died and the veil that had cherubims on it, and you find out in Ezekiel, cherubims have eyes all over them. That veil was ripped open. That's a message. The veil represents the flesh of Jesus. You see, Jesus said, I'm the door. And Paul said, we go through a new and living way. We go through a doorway, but this door is alive. Jesus is our veil. He's our door. Veils were doors also to get you into a glorious room. Well, when he died and his body died on the cross, his flesh died. That's why the veil opened up because he's trying to tell us the veil represents his. He had to physically die so that you could get beyond the veil. That represents getting to heaven one day. That represents seeing the glory. So we died with Jesus and we see the kingdom. The cherubim had eyes all over them. Now, see, there's a kind of a message here. Oh, I want to get this in before this closes tonight. Picture a veil. And on there, there's cherubims sewn into it. Pictures of cherubims. And Ezekiel said they had eyes all over them. Now, veils stop you from seeing past it. So here you get cherubims with eyes all over them, talking about seeing, seeing, tons of seeing going on here. But yet it's on a veil. See, there's a message. There's a hidden message there. It's like a secret message to the Christian. See the cherubims on there with eyes all over them? And this is on a veil that stops you from seeing? Well, you're going to see you're going to see. See all these eyes? It's emphasizing seeing. And when Jesus died on the cross, that veil was ripped open and people could see past the veil. That is all symbolic, folks, of seeing the glory. The book of Revelation, chapter 4, has a door opened in heaven. It's like an unveiling of heaven. And then John got in the Spirit. And you know what we've been doing tonight? God, if your heart's been believing what I'm saying, you're starting to get something in your soul and in your heart. An unveiling's happening, and you're starting to see. Are you starting to see tonight? Hallelujah. Cherubim represent the ministry. In Revelation 6, when I saw the Lamb open one of the seals, 
I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, and one of the four beasts said, Come and see. And I saw. Now, these beasts were the cherubim from the Old Testament. They had eyes all over them. If you read Revelation 4 and verse 7, it talked about the lion, the ox, and the eagle, and the man. That's what Ezekiel saw in the cherubim. They had four faces, the lion, the ox, and the eagle, and the man. And God is raising like ministries that have eyes to see. God has shown me some things. And my ministry, I've been ministering now since 1990. I'm helping people see. I'm helping you tonight see. So it's like the cherubims represent the ministry. And they're helping you see beyond the veil. Am I helping you tonight? That's what the ministry's for. And that revelation that God helps you see through a minister is what changes you into his image. In other words, you're going to start living like Jesus more now, in victory. You're going to do what he did, and Jesus said, you shall do greater than me. Oh, I wish I had time to talk about so much of that. I'd be here hours on hours, but we can only give you so much here tonight. You will live the resurrected life. Once you see with the eyes of your understanding, and God says, let there be light, and the light of the glorious gospel, the light in the face of Jesus changes you into his image, or the light of the knowledge of the glory of God shines in your heart. 2 Corinthians 3 and 18, 2 Corinthians 4 and 6. God said, let there be light, Genesis chapter 1. Then he sets you free, and you can begin living a more spiritual life because you realize, number one, wait a minute, Mike, you're telling me that the Bible teaches that my heart that fully believes in Jesus and loves him and serves him, I live for him, I go to church, I serve him, I, I study, I pray, I don't want to sin, I want to get victory. You're telling me that a person like me that's a real believer has power toward me that raised Jesus from the dead? You're telling me that it, I've got power toward me that put him on the throne? The power that destroyed the devil's kingdom? The power that took the devil's power of death and broke it? That's toward me? I'm going to have way more victory in my life now. I've got so much more faith. I get so much more glory because I see. I see. You see, once you understand something and how it works, if I told you, you get power to destroy the devil, you'd walk away and say, well, that's a good thought, Mike, but I think you're missing a few marbles up there. But then if I explain to you why that's the case, because you died with Jesus and you being connected like a vine is to a branch, and the sap flowing from the vine, resurrection power in Jesus is flowing in you, and the power that God raised Jesus from is in you, when you put all that together and you understand this kind of sermon I'm preaching, you don't walk away scratching your head and saying, Mike's losing his marbles. No, you start walking away saying, I had my marbles lost and I'm getting them back now. <laughs> I'm starting to understand the truth now. Praise God. And the cherubims and the elders. And let me close with this. And in Revelation 11 or 4 and 8, the four beasts, these are the cherubims, had each of them six wings about him and they were full of eyes. Remember I said they were full of eyes? And they rest not day and night saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. That's the cherubim. That's the four beasts. But in verse 4, four verses earlier, round the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment and crowns on their heads of gold. The four beasts, God showed me this one day. Like, I, I'm so, pray folks, pray. And God will show you things. I never heard anyone notice, preach this before to me. He said, Mike, look in verse eight. How many six, six wings on each of these four beasts? So if there's four beasts and they're each got, how many wings is that? 24. Go back to verse four. How many elders are seated around the throne? 24. And then I got thinking, whoa, the wings are related to the elders. Each elder is covered by a wing. And see, that's what I'm saying. The ministry with eyes all over them represent ministries like me and pastors and teachers and prophets, evangelists, um, apostles. They cover and they minister to you and you become an elder. You're not an infant and a child anymore. When you're born again, you're a baby. Adults aren't born. Babies. So spiritually, you might be 50 years old, but if you get born again today, you're a baby. But by the ministry, 
teaching you and showing you these things, you become an elder. You become an elder. And just like those cherubim wings on the Ark of the Covenant, you're seated with Jesus under those wings. Didn't Paul say you're seated with him? These administered truths like I'm giving you in this lesson are causing you to see yourself seated with Jesus. And that Ark of the Covenant represents the throne of God that Jesus, that's called a mercy seat, the lid on the Ark. A seat is what you sit on. And if you're sitting with Jesus, you're on that seat. And you are in the rest. You're seated and you're a mature elder. You know how people say to you, take a load off your feet and sit down. Well, spiritually speaking, some of you have had too much of a load on your shoulders, too much of a load on your feet. You've never learned to rest. The devil's been running around in circles and you think he had more power than you. But you heard Mike preach tonight that you got power on your life that can destroy the devil just like it destroyed him on the cross. He'll be destroyed in your life. Hallelujah. And then I don't have to be run ragged like this anymore. I can rest. I'm going to be seated with Jesus and rest and take a load off my feet and become an elder. Elders are seated. Kids run around. Elders are seated. They're mature and they rest. Kids don't rest. When we're young in the Lord, we don't know these truths and we're run ragged and we can't rest. Things bother us. If life bothers you, if COVID-19 is driving you crazy, if, if the election in the States is messing your mind up, you're not resting. You need to learn what the truth says about Jesus and the cross and the power he has for you and take a load off your feet and sit down and rest. Wings of administered truth. In Ezekiel 1 and 24, and when they went, these cherubims, he said, I heard the noise of their wings. Remember there are 24 of them? Like the noise of great waters, like the voice of the Almighty, the word of God. The wings represent the word being administered to you. The wings sound like the word. Do you hear a word coming from me? The voice of speech, like the noise of a host or an army. When they stood, they let down their wings. In Psalm 91 and 4, He shall cover thee with his feathers, his wings. Under his wings shalt thou trust. Sit down under his wings and trust on the mercy seat. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. And Ruth 2 and 12 said, The Lord recompense thy work, Ruth. Oh, you should read the story of Ruth. And a full reward be given thee of the Lord of God of Israel under whose wings you have come to trust. There's another picture, sitting on the throne with Jesus under his wings. It's everywhere in the Bible once you start realizing it. So, Jesus said, Jerusalem, I would have gathered you under my wings as a hen gathers her chicks, but you would not. He would have taught them the new covenant. He would have covered them and protected them under his wings. They would have been protected from the Roman armies that 40 years later destroyed their temple in A.D. 70. They would have been raised with Jesus over all powers, like we are as Christians. But they rejected him. But the doors open to all nations today, even Israel. Let us rule now with Jesus. How often would I have gathered you, he said in Matthew 23 and 37, under her wings, and you would not. Praise God. Oh, hallelujah. Thank God for his goodness. Let me take this back again. Isn't God good? Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I pray, God, this comes alive. I pray that if people will leave this and go to Ephesians chapter 1 and read that and, and read 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and on into chapter 4 and, and look at the book of Genesis and when they read, let there be light, they think of their own hearts with light shining on them. And God, if they believe with all their heart, when their heart would turn to you, Lord, you'd take a veil away and you'd start changing them. I pray that happens to everybody that watches this. In the name of Jesus Christ. Wow, wow, wow. Where do we go from here? What do we do with this form of teaching? Just like I said, grow in the Lord and have victory in your life. Amen.